Toddy took an ocean for to cross the ocean wide And he left his love behind him walking by the Liverpool tide For a week she wept full sorely, tore her hair and wrung her hand Till she met another sailor walking on the Liverpool side Fair maid, why are you weeping for your Johnny gone to sea? If you wed with me tomorrow, I will kind and constant be. I will buy you sheets and blankets, I will buy you a wedding ring. You shall have a gilded cradle, or to rock your baby in. Johnny Todd came back from sailing, sailing o'er the ocean wide, and he found his fair and false one was another sailor's bride. Now all ye men who go a sailing for to fight the foreign foe, don't you leave your love like Johnny. Marry her before you go. Hello, everybody. Welcome. Hi, How are you all doing? Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Um, that was just a wee short wee um, synopsis. I uh, hope you enjoyed it, and uh, we'll see you next week. <laughs> that's not it um yes everybody will be going on mute now um and we'll we'll kick into the uh celebration of this evening uh really celebrating what would have been jimmy ellis's 90th birthday um so this event has been organized by the east side greenways part of the east side partnership um and it's a wonderful and a very fitting tribute to uh, a true East Belfast boy. And it not only marks Jimmy's birthday, his 90th birthday, but also the fourth anniversary of the opening of the James Ellis Bridge on the Collinswater Community Greenway, uh, which is close to the Ellis family home in Park Avenue. But more of all of that later, because actually bridges feature very significantly in Jimmy's life, um, which we will, we will come to learn. Most notably, of course, uh, the Sam Thompson play over the bridge, um, which ultimately le led Jimmy to leave for England, uh, where of course then he found fame and fortune and and set him on that course for history. But um, yes, he, he built a lot of bridges um, between communities and, and the, the uh, James Ellis Bridge is, a, is an absolutely fitting tribute to a wonderful man. Um, but tonight what we're going to do is probably find out that there was more to Jimmy um, than the actor and the activist that we all know. Um, he was also a prolific writer, a poet, a translator, a speaker of many languages, um, of Greek, French, Romanian, to name a few. Um, so tonight is expected to last just a wee bit over <coughs> an hour. Um, it will be uh, informal and we're gonna speak to a couple of people either uh, in person um, on the Zoom chat or actually some have recorded pieces that they're going to uh, say as well. Um, do use the chat function, anybody who is um, a Zoom uh, fanatic like most of us at this stage, um, feel free to use the chat um, for any sort of reflections or anything. Um, and tonight's event will be recorded and uh, a few pictures will be taken for social media and that. So, uh, just turn off your cameras if you're camera shy. Um, so on with the show. Um, I just want to say before we start, I feel very privileged uh, to be asked to host tonight's event. Um, and I was asked to, to do that by Rabina, um, Jimmy's wife. Um, I never met Jimmy and honestly, I feel so very sad about that um, because I know I would have loved him. <laughs> I, um, I know I would have loved 
having the crack and telling a yarn and sharing a pint and all that. And he also played the piano, so I'm certain there would have been an Irish sing song or two involved as well. Um, but I learned about him and, and uh, learned to admire him through his poetry, through his, um, his work. So a few years ago, I was asked by Rabina to produce one of his unpublished works um, about his childhood in growing up in East Belfast. Um, so when we first met and she heard that I produced musicals or I was into musicals, she said, I have something for you. I says, what, has Jimmy written a musical? Um, and it wasn't quite a musical, but actually uh, music plays a big part in it. And um, we'll have quite a bit of music throughout the evening as well. Um, but um, musicals were my thing, but words are also my thing. So I, 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 um, I read English at Trinity quite a few years ago. Um, so the piece we ended up producing was a lovely blend of poetry, language and, and music. Um, Anyway, that's where I joined the story kind of right at the end, sadly after Jimmy's death. Um, but let's go back to the bit that we know. So um, that first bit, Jimmy as the actor and activist. So the um, East Side Partnership has been an event that's been organized um, as a number of, of different events to celebrate. Um, the man and the, the legacy he was. And it was a, there was a beautiful tribute, I don't know if you saw it last week, uh, on his night, what would have been his 90th birthday on the 15th of March. Uh, and James Nesbitt called him a trailblazer, um, and he definitely was. He began to act um, with the Belfast based uh, Ulster Group Theatre back in the 1950s. And he also made the now famous, of course, uh, rebellious opposition to censorship in the arts um, for Sam Thompson's play Over the Bridge. Um, and then, of course, when he moved to London in the early 60s, he paved the way for, for really uh, the Northern Irish accent to be heard on national TV um, in his role as Bert in, in Z Cars. Um, at the end of, of Jimmy's book, Troubles Over the Bridge, which I, I have by my side, um, <laughs> there you have one too. I'm sure many of us here on the Zoom call have it. Um, he ends with a poem um, named after the, the great play um, Over the Bridge and written many years after um, when he was reminiscing about that very important time in his life, so touring the play between Belfast Dublin and London, um, and then his eventual departure from Northern Ireland um, to England. So what we'll start with tonight is we'll hear from Jimmy's old friend Adrian Dunbar uh, recite that poem. Here is a poem from Jimmy called Over the Bridge. I crossed the bridge and sought to shake the dust from off my feet, but it was not to be. For though I fled across the Irish Sea, nursing resentment and profound disgust that individuals had betrayed their trust and held the public stage in ignominy, events overtook the ancient enemy and time has mellowed memory as it must. Homeward I crawl, a wretched prodigal, to bide a while and then depart again, to leave once more, once more to feel bereft. Your picture album in my mental hold all, the hills of Antrim etched upon my heart, for truth to tell, I never really left. Um, East Belfast and Belfast, Northern Ireland was um, always, for as, as long as, as Jimmy was alive, um, played a major part in his life. He came home very often um, and he was also a, a, a big supporter of, of all things Northern Irish, uh, young actors. Um, he helped support and mentor many, many people who 
um, who still talk about that influence that Jimmy had in his life. Um, and of course, he performed um, in the, the Billy plays, which was um, the starting point for our Belfast Kenneth Branagh also as well. Um, what we will move on to um, is probably the lesser known element of Jimmy's life. And this was one area that um, Rabina was very keen for us to um, really concentrate on tonight. <clears throat> because, um, as I said at the beginning, um, as well as, as all his acting and activism, um, he was a prolific writer. Um, and the slide here, I'll just ask Heather to show us, gives us just a quick overview of some of the works um, of Jimmy. Uh, Rabina kindly put this anthology together for me, um, but she also left out um, quite a lot of it um, and, and just really picked on the, the key things. Um, and you'll see that uh, quite a lot of the work were translations. Um, Jimmy credits is, is, er, credited his interest in writing and translating down to a wonderful French teacher when Jimmy, um, via a scholarship he won, uh, to was at Methody College. Um, <laughs> And he also uh, got 100% in his French exam at the time, but he obviously had a, a big flair for languages. Um, but he didn't actually start writing seriously until he was in his 60s. Um, so translating Greek mythology, as you can see um, there, French poetry um, and Romanian, would you please? Um, uh, we'll come on to that in a bit. Uh, but now let's bring in um, one of our guests tonight, who's on the Zoom, uh, Professor David Johnson, who's a um, professor of modern languages at Queen's, to talk about this element uh, of, of Jimmy's life. David, are you there? Yes, I am here. Can you hear me? I can, yes. Heather, Heather will just spotlight you now. <coughs> Hi there. Um, I, I believe, David, it was you who gave Jimmy his honorary doctorate from Queen's back in 2008, but you'd met him um, long before that, um, I believe, in a translation of your own. Tell us a wee bit about your relationship with Jimmy Ellis. Um, I, I first met Jimmy in 1998 when I just translated Value and Clans, wonderful play, Divine Words, for BBC Radio 3. And... Uh, it's a play about rural violence, the grotesqueness of life, uh, where alcohol leads to oblivion and violence all the time. But in spite of that, I resisted the temptation to set it in Ireland, and we kept it set in the, the Celtic corner of Northwest Spain, that is Galicia. And because it was a radio play, we got the most fantastic stellar Irish cast. 1998, T.P. McKenna, Dennis Hawthorne, Saoirse Cusack, uh, Francis Tomalty, Jerry McSorley, uh, Patrick O'Kane, and of course, Jimmy Ellis. And Jimmy was playing the part of the blind man of Gondomar, uh, who was a sort of a, a seer of things invisible, a seer of visions. And uh, uh, I was starstruck on the first day. Jimmy didn't come in until the second day. And I remember sitting in the green room with all of these actors and Jimmy walked in and it was suddenly as if they'd been plugged into the mains. There was a clamor went round the room and the formidable Kate Rowland, who was uh, directing the play simply said, Jimmy, you behave yourself. And uh, then she said, Jimmy, this is David. And he said to me, ah, you're the translator. Come over here and talk to me. And I thought, oh God, he's gonna rip the play apart. And instead, what he said was, do you not think translation is about making space? And, and I thought, wow. Um, and we began to talk. Now, I've written in various places that my academic career, and what I mean by academic career is thinking things through and writing about them, that's all. But my academic career has been more helped by the conversations I've had with writers and actors and directors than it has been by other academics. Um, I've never really said which conversations I meant, but this is one of them. We talked in the green room. 
we talked over lunch and we talked over a, a few drinks that evening about translation as a source of hospitality, translation as a dialogue between worlds, translation as a way of expanding yourself through created relation with, um, with other cultures, other languages. And it was a, on that day, it was only the it was only my first meeting with James. I only met him. Uh, I only met him twice. I'm sorry to say, although that seems to be twice better than you, Claire. Uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, on that day, I was really, really touched and moved by the way in which he bothered to reassure me that I had a sense of translation that he understood and that he was working to as well. Fantastic. Um, did he did he speak to you at that time about any of his works? Because um, I know we're going to go on to that. No, he didn't. Mm. No, he and and that's surprising. Um, I um, I think he I think he realised that I was halfway between out of my depth <laughs> and sort of clambering up the side of the pool yeah, to, be, um, to be with this cast. And he he talked to me about the, the play that we were we were putting on at that time, the play that we were recording. Well, let's let's go on to um, or speak a wee bit more about Jimmy's writing and, and translations, as you say. Um, so, uh, what the first one should we talk about Romanian Symphony? So this this was um, as I said, he translated Greek. Uh, he was fluent, obviously, or more or less, at least academically in French and, and translated quite a lot of Ronsard's poetry. And, um, but he also taught himself Romanian, I believe, uh, with an Italian dictionary and remembering some of the Latin he had learned all those years ago in Methody. Yeah, so tell us a bit about Romanian symphony then. Uh, that, that's extraordinary. Uh, <laughs> but he taught himself Romanian through its contact with other Romance languages. Um, uh, you know, translators are always aware about what is the same and what is different, where sameness and difference co cohabit. And he must have looked at his Latin, at his French, and thought, this is where Romanian is the same, and this is where it's different. And to have done that is an extraordinary thing. Um, his Romanian symphony, um, I'm abashed to say, that I only uh, uh, read it for the first time when I was thinking about what I might say this evening. And contrary to what any of you may, may, may think, I have thought about <laughs> what I want to say this evening. Uh, it's an extraordinary uh, document. Uh, I, I read the hundred and whatever it is, handwritten pages by any standard. It's an extraordinary work. Uh, it opens with a sort of extraordinary search for meaning that placelessness entails. It's about not knowing how to read the signs and the architecture of an unfamiliar, of an unfamiliar place, and then only slowly seeing patterns emerge that connect the difference of there with the sameness of here. And I think there and here, then and now, were for Jimmy life's two key movements. The first movement of the symphony is called Indentations. Can I read just the first half dozen lines? Please do, yeah. Uh, it's laid out very, very intricately. Uh, indentations, imprints on the pavement, indentations on the sidewalk, hundreds upon thousands of them, hundreds and thousands. Childhood memories? No, they were monochrome. What do they signify? Are they a code, an alphabet, braille for bare feet, undeciphered hieroglyphics, or is the effect entirely decorative? And he writes decorative in capital letters in a way that is compelling, but also seems unconvinced. So Romanian Symphony is a wonderful poem about a search for meaning from somebody who is not from there, but intuitively understands the there from his own position and experience of life. Because of course the indentations refer to uh, bullet marks after the shooting of Ceausescu. That's it's right. A wonderful poem. Yeah. So yeah, as you say, he, he um, the poem gets 
it's inspiration from from those bullet holes in the wall he saw um, for, from where uh, him, him and his wife were executed. Um, thank you for reading that. It's 170 pages and well done you for, for getting through it. I think, I think we expected you to read maybe first five or six. <laughs> If you like, I'll read the whole, the whole 170 pages. <laughs> we'll do that as our part two of this event. This, as I said at the beginning, which is why I rushed through the, the first bit around uh, Jimmy's well-known life, I suppose. We could really spend all evening talking about his writing. It's, it's, it's quite incredible. Um, it, we'll move on to Coo Holland, uh, Hound of Ulster. So this is a full-length play, um, which Jimmy has written. Um, uh, and as with all his pieces, he wanted and uh, wished for all of them to be performed um, out loud or on stage or, you know, as a, as a performance. They're all very theatrical. Um, tell us a wee bit about this one, if you can. I, I, I really don't know very much about it, other than what fascinates me again is, his, is just the whole range of his writing. He was always interested in mythology. He, he, and the reason why I said about one of the great movements in his life being from then to now, he goes right back to the, the Latin, the Greek, Irish mythology and traces meanings from then to now. I would love to see it staged. Yeah, absolutely. As would Rubina, I'm sure, um, because, uh, you know, she knows the, the value in, in so much of his work that's sitting on his desk. Um, what we're going to do now, David, thank you so much, uh, and I'll come back to you, is uh, play a recorded video of Stuart Graham, um, the actor Stuart Graham. I'm not sure if Stuart actually was able to join the Zoom tonight, if he is, fantastic. Um, but we recorded him earlier in the week, reciting two pieces from Cúhollin, Hound, Hound Foster. So if you can play that now, thank you. The sea of Moyle is as bright as a burnished shield. The cliffs of Tor are ablaze in the dawn of day. And drowsy oaks shake immemorial locks, as petulant streams bound headlong from their courses to roar in rebellious rapture over crags and rocks, or tumble from lofty ledges to catch the eye of the sun god in displays of golden splendor. Two ridges of basalt hem in a hidden valley. A more cautious stream meanders here, not over keen to enter the unpredictable ocean. On the heights above, commanding waves, heath and secret glen with access to the sea, affording in fair weather full sight of Caledonia, stands the castle of Dunvary. There, Cúhollin waits. As a thousand billows break on a rocky shore, so Swaran's army advances, wave on wave. As towering cliffs resist the roaring sea, so Cormac's Erin wards off Swaran's onslaught. Death cries aloud and echoes off the shields. Each hero is a rock, each sword a beam of light. The field reverberates wing to wing as a hundred hammers rise by turns from the anvil. Who are these spectres upon the heath, these dark shades like clouds lit up by lightning flashes? The hills are troubled. The rocks tremble beneath their moss. Who is it but ocean's intrepid sun and the valiant blue-eyed car-born hound of Ulster? Anxious eyes weigh up the trial of strength as heroic figures dim in the fading light night falls and ends the appalling fight such is the futility of war the living mourn dead heroes live no more that's beautiful and thank you to Stuart, if you're here for that, that piece. Um, the next piece I'd like to go on to is um, The Evening Star, and I'll bring David back to talk about that. Uh, before that, um, 
one of the pieces on, on the um, anthology that was uh, just shown there a few minutes ago, um, Jimmy translated a lot of um, French poetry, so Pierre Duronsard's love poetry, um, most of his love poetry actually. Um, as a little piece of information I learned um, as I was researching for tonight, which of course I should have known as an ex-English uh, graduate, but didn't, uh, was that Ronsard actually wrote the famous line, all the world's a stage, um, and he was born a good 30 years before Shakespeare. Um, but then I learned that in fact many uh, of the English Renaissance poets borrowed ideas and images from Ronsard. So I imagine that's what attracted uh, Jimmy to his work. Um, but his his uh, his translations of those poems are, are, are stunning and never to do things by half, um, as you can tell by uh, the 170 page um, which David has, has read for, for us. Um, Jimmy was actually made an honorary member of the Ronsard Society when him and Rubina visited their headquarters in France. Um, they were actually, they were flabbergasted that he knew and had translated so much of his poetry. Um, we will move on now to the Evening Star. So this is Jimmy's translation of Emanescu's famous poem. Um, and Emanescu, uh, being the most famous and most influential Romanian poet. Um, so I'll bring David back now, uh, if you're still there, David, uh, to, I, to talk. I'm still here, Claire, yeah. Um, I don't know the original, um, and you don't need to know the original to read this translation and enjoy it as a poem in its, in its own right. Uh, what the Ronsar translations and the Romanian translation show is an absolute, and what we've just heard from Stuart, who read that so beautifully, is an absolute mastery of form. And for, for somebody who had so much to say, as Jimmy had, uh, and I, I learned that on both the occasions that I, that I met him, he uses translation as a writer who wants to say less of his own and do service or justice to the writer that he's translating. Um, and he does that by not silencing himself, but by engaging in a sort of created relation, a dialogue. Uh, in the Ronsar poems, Ronsar's spirituality, his melancholy tone, and his ultimate belief in love and social justice are the same as in Ronsar, but they're different in the translations because they're shaped as is the evening star through the experience and sensibility of an East Belfast man living in England. And there's something about exile that lies at the heart of translation. And there's something I think about exile that lies at the heart of James Ellis, the writer. Well, of course, because that stayed with him um, forever and, and was really the basis of the inspiration for many of his Poetries and one of the first pieces which he had written was a, a recollection of his own childhood home and the exile. Well, the refuge from exile that that home gave him, and and all all those all, all those thoughts, of course. Um, thank you, thanks for that. What we're going to do now is introduce um, Katie Tumulty, who hopefully is on the Zoom, um, to read just a small um, piece from the Evening Star. Hi, Katie. You're on mute, if you can. Is that you? On mute. That's you. As bards and ancient poets say, once upon a time into a royal dynasty was born a maid sublime. An only child words can't convey her far beyond compare, as Mary outshines saints, let's say, or moonshine dims a star. From gloomy pitch dark vaults by night, she tiptoed silently, and from her casement caught first sight of Lucifer in glory. As he rose up to light the sky, she kept their assignation whilst he in regal majesty kept watch upon the ocean. Night after night, she watched her star 
love kindling in her breast, whilst he who smouldered from afar knew neither peace nor rest. Her head supported on her arm against the window sill, her heart bemused by wistful charms, desires yet unfulfilled. Whilst he, the fiercely ardent wooer, looked down in admiration upon the donjon dark and drear to match her adoration. With stealth and speed his goals was reached, he silently persuasive, those strong protective walls were breached and he was all pervasive. As she creeps softly into bed, in sweet repose she lies. His light is on her fingers shed, his beam anoints her eyes. Framed within the looking glass, her weary limbs at rest. He bathes in fire her lovely face and gleams across her breast. Her lips are softened by a smile in his reflective glow. His rays, her inmost dreams beguile and hover like a halo. The while she lies in slumber chased and murmurs through a sigh. O oh, loving master, brave and blessed, O oh, Lord of light, reply. Come to me, Lucifer, my own heart's desire. Invade my room, my bedchamber. Consume me with your fire. Lucifer smiles from afar to hear her anxious plea. Then, like a reckless shooting star, he plunges in the sea. A wave leaps up with swirling motion, cascading where he fell. When out of that unfathomed ocean, a youth rose from the swell who stepping from the sea drenched strand through her casement passes, and in his hand he grasps a wand, bedecked with reeds and grasses. A youthful prince of royal blood with thick set golden hair, the purple shroud in which he stood sets off his shoulders bare. A glacial glow shone from his gaze, his cheeks were deathly pale, a bloodless corpse in mortal guise, his life beyond the veil. Through galaxies and spheres I'm driven with fearsome urgency. My father is the dome of heaven, my mother is the sea. To keep this royal assignation in token of your love, I, the child of sky and ocean, have quit the world above. Arise, fair maiden, of honoured worth, disown this mortal life, for Lucifer has come to earth to claim you as his wife, and you will live eternally in castles light as ether, your subjects creatures of the sea and birds of every feather. Your looks are heavenly, kind youth, an angel in disguise, but mortal terror stops my mouth and makes me temporize. Your voice and dress are stark and still. I live and you do not. Your gaze betrays a deathly chill. My soul is fear with fraught. Thank you, Katie. Thank you. Thanks so much. No problem. Um, thank you to you, you and to David um, for that piece. Do you want to tell us a wee bit, Katie, about your um, relationship with Jimmy and his work? Yeah, well, I met Jimmy um, when I was 19. In fact, it was a show that I got my equity card on. Um, mm -hmm. Jimmy was directing and it was a Graham Reed Billy play. Um, it was the Billy trilogy. So there was the three televised versions were, were kind of reworked and put into play for um, the Arts Theatre and for a tour. 
Um, Jimmy was an amazing director. I mean, you know, he directed in parables. And by that, I mean, he told stories. If you were kind of lost with your journey or your motivation or, or whatever, as a character, you know, within the play, he, he told stories. I mean, some of the times we were going, I was going, what's the bite, you know? And I was like, come on. And then bang, he just, you know, the, the world lit up, the room lit up. And, and all of a sudden I had the vision as to where to move to next. He was, he was an absolute gentleman, an absolute star. And it was, it was lovely to know, absolutely brilliant to know. Well, that's wonderful. Thank you so much. And thank oh, you no for that reading. Of, uh, no worries, thank you. Um, the next poem I'd like to uh, talk about is um, called The Lake of Garda. So Jimmy uh, wrote when himself and Rubina were, um, were in Italy and staying um, on in, in a hotel overlooking the lake. It was around the time of Princess Diana's death in 1997. Um, and Jimmy would wake up very early every morning and look across the lake for inspiration. So he wrote this poem and dedicated to the memory of, of um, Diana. Um, it's a beautiful poem. Uh, it's very long. Uh, that's in keeping with with Jimmy's in four parts um, so far too long to recite here um, but there is a, a short prologue to the poem um, which when I read it I asked Rubina if she wouldn't mind if I would recite it or could recite it um, it's just heavenly um, I got married in Italy um, and oh, learned a very tiny bit of Italian so that I, I was able to converse with the priest and say say my thank yous and all that um, and in, in Florence not Lake Garda but this just spoke to me as if I was right back there so um, I'll read this short prologue called The Green Island. When heaven shall choose my hour to leave behind the light of common day I wish intend Ordain no stone be carved in gold set nigh to kings. No marble slab be raised, no pomp or circumstance surround my tomb. But here on this green island, a tree shall be my shade forever green. It's stunning. <laughs> I might steal it from the epitaph. <laughs> uh, Okay, um, thank you so much um, to, to David for, for that piece and uh, Katie and, and Stuart. Um, I'm going to introduce now Colm. So Colm um, Doran was the recipient of the first James Ellis bursary from Queen's. Um, and uh, he'll tell us a bit about what that has meant and, and uh, what Jimmy's legacy still means to a, a young generation of directors and and theatre makers. So Colm, tell us a bit about your connection to Jimmy. Well, thanks very much, Claire. Can you hear me okay? I'm not still on mute, am I? You're you're heard well and clear. Loud and clear, <laughs> great. Um no the the, the bursary was uh, incredible. Um I, I remember when it when I first saw that this this had appeared, this opportunity um through Queens and I had graduated about two years before and I was telling my parents about it and they were they had talked about James Ellis as I was growing up about the, the Billy plays, about Zed cars and about the, his voice being so distinctive. My family had often talked about him being the first Ulster accent that they could remember on TV and that, how, how, what that meant to see your own, your own voice on television. Now, now a bit more common, thankfully, but back then not so much. Um, so I was, you know, it was a wonderful opportunity that the bursary um, held. It was an opportunity to have three months of paid, uh, work and training with uh, a theatre company and I chose to go with Prime Cut Productions because I had worked with the artistic director Emma Jordan um, on a few well on one or two little development uh, pieces um, so I had that, that little connection already. Um, the first production that I worked on uh, as a result of the bursary was uh, in the lyric actually uh, Lovers, Winners and Losers and uh, losers being the sort of lesser uh, produced side of the play, winners, Freel's winners is very often with the romantic, you know, lovers on the hill. It's often uh, staged, but losers, which is sort of love in, in uh, advanced years and sort of on the other side of it, um, is, is, lesser, is lesser known. So it was beautiful. And I remember actually there's a, there's a sort of connection to what I read about uh, Jimmy's connection to Sam Thompson's The Evangelist. 
where he was um, a, a sort of a nice connection because he was teaching Sam the gospel hymns uh, that, that would be useful for, for the play that he would, that um, this could be included. Um, much in the same way that I took the losers cast on one particular day and I had to teach them the Catholic rosary. It was three uh, Protestant actresses who had never heard or never had experience of the Catholic rosary and all it said in Freo's directions was they recite a decade of the rosary and we'd skipped over it for the first few weeks and we got to the point where they were going so this bit where we do the rosary uh is anybody going to tell us what then what we have to do so i had to take them off and i had to, not only had to write it all out but i had to go back to what was the rosary in the 1950s and 60s what what was it how was it phrased uh, at that time because claire as you know they tend the catholic church tend to change the wording every so often just to catch us out um but that that was that was a lovely first production to work on and obviously working in the lyric was a pinch me moment for me. I mean, I had never, I had never worked in that scale of theater space. It was the first time I'd really uh, worked as an assistant director and it was an incredible opportunity um, to, to be across such a big production, which I would never have got the chance to if it hadn't been for the bursary. And then I moved on to work on um, a lovely festival uh, for mental health, male mental health, uh, held in the Mac called Edge Fest. And uh, it, was a, it was working across two different productions uh, both two one-man shows. Um, one was East Belfast Boy, which you already actually said, Claire, uh, East Belfast Boy, very different East Belfast Boy. Um, it was a sort of thumping techno uh, story of a young working class Protestant DJ uh, and his sort of dealing with becoming a new father and his mental state, um, very physical, very stylized. And the other piece was uh, Every Day I Wake Up Hopeful by John Patrick Higgins. Uh, which was a sort of narrative piece about um, suicide and, and about one man sort of dealing in the course of an evening with his own suicidal thoughts in the wake of his partner dying. Two he quite heavy plays, but beautiful and, and, and a, a wonderful opportunity to work on. Um, um, this segues quite nicely, Colm, into our next section, which you're also involved with, but is basically Jimmy as an East Belfast boy. So yeah. Jimmy as a young man. Um, you worked with myself um, on, on Blum Fringe Productions and uh, Marty on Home Again mm -hmm. um, column, which was uh, an adaptation of uh, an anthology of, as I was saying earlier, um, poems called Portrait of a House, which is about Jimmy's yes. reflections of his life as an East Belfast boy. Um, but thank you so much for your um, your memories and and uh, and. Uh, hey. I'm so indebted. I'm really so indebted. And I'm so grateful to be here tonight because he's so much a part of, of my what, what I've been able to do as a theatre maker. I could never have done without the James Ellis bursary. And I, I love talking about him to anybody that I can. And normally in a rehearsal room, someone has a memory or a story to tell about working with him and their knowledge of him. So he's very much alive for me. And you didn't meet uh, Jimmy himself, did you? I didn't, I didn't. But Claire, funnily, sim similar to you working on that piece uh, with Blunt Fringe, which I'm so glad that you allowed me to, to have a have a, a little um, job working on. Um, uh, meeting him as a writer in that production, you know, and really seeing him as a writer, because up until then I had only really knowledge of him as a performer and seeing his perspective on his own childhood and the, the description of, his house that had become the boarding house with the, the characters that were staying there and his relationship to his family and his sister Eileen and, and then the death of his father as, as, as he grows up. Uh, just stunning, you know, really evocative of the time as well of that space of overlooking the shipyards and what was going on at Belfast at the time, as, as well as being a beautiful piece of personal history of his, his life and so beautifully observed. It was yeah. gorgeous to be a part of. Well, that is a lovely introduction to, to Home Again, um, which, as you say, um, was based on that house in Park Avenue, his sister Eileen, his mother Tilly, who was in an, in our production played by Katie. Uh, who Beautifully. Was and uh, his father, James, who was played by Stuart Graham, who, who we heard earlier on. Um, yeah, he, uh, Jimmy started to write that sequence of poems um, uh, you know, quite late in uh, the year 2000, um, when his sister uh, moved into uh, sheltered accommodation and he was walking around the empty 
vacant house now um, that had been their, you know, their home for 60 years um, and had been the backdrop to his youth and childhood. And as we were saying earlier, very much a refuge for him as somebody who always saw himself as um, exiled a bit from, um, you know, living away from, from where his, his heart uh, lay in East Belfast. It's a really nostalgic piece. Um, and uh, I produced it as part of the East Side Arts Festival in 2018, um, uh, which Co Colin was referring to, and then again as part of the Maritime Festival the year later. Um, we're going to show a wee piece from that actually now. Uh, we have uh, a recording, although I have noticed that Stuart Graham is actually here. Um, so if he wants to, he could he could do this live, but just give me a, a nod or no. no. <laughs> it's lovely to see you, Stuart, and thank you so much for joining. Um, but yes, we're gonna we're gonna show a little piece of that now. The first bit is a scene with Stuart reciting the poem uh, Carpe Diem, which also actually features as the prologue to Jimmy's uh, book, Troubles Over the Bridge. And um, we'll play that now. And with the falling leaves. Doesn't take the time long going in. A distinctly Ulster turn of phrase, for strangers hard to grasp, but, but you and I, old friend, know only too well its implications. The years have simply flown. Le temps s'en va, mon ami. Time flies. Too soon the present fades to memory as recollections become mere islands in an infinite sea of vagueness. Future plans are speculative. The diary is a provisional guide. Yet the spur of carpe diem is still a powerful drive, so grasp the day. For when all is said and done, old friend, doesn't take the time long. It's actually been cut just a wee bit too short there. It doesn't take the time long going in. Um, that's beautiful. Uh, yes, yeah, so the, the, that piece called Home Again, um, as I said, is just a, we, we, we decided to choose um, only three acts to perform um, because otherwise it would be performed for about five or six hours, the amount of material in that anthology. It was incredible. So. We, we uh, focused on the house and the family in Park Avenue um, and then the lodgers that um, uh, were basically inhabited the house, the, the spur room in the house um, all over the war years. And there were amazing characters who came and went um, um, in that house. And then the last bit, the empty house at the end um, as the family kind of grew and moved on. Um, and, and we, we got, um, I got fellow East Belfast um, novelist author, Glenn Patterson to, to adapt it with us. It was directed by uh, Martin McDowell. And um, yeah, but I'll show you another wee piece of it now. Um, Cause remember this was sold to me as a, a musical, <laughs> well, a play with music. Um, and, but music was definitely a big part of it and a big part of Jimmy. In fact, actually I forgot to say earlier on, as well as getting hundred percent in his French exam in Methody, which was unheard of, um, even now I'm sure. Um, he also got hundred percent in his piano exam. Um, he was a great pianist and uh, you know, music was very much part of that family home. So his mother took in lodgers, but um, the the um, the home was also filled with the wider kind of family circle, um, Auntie Madge, cousin Joy, and various other uh, other people who came, um, who would join Saturday evenings mostly for for uh, musical evenings around the piano. So um, let's see and hear a wee bit of uh, from the production uh, celebrating the music. Johnny and Lily were regular visitors on Wednesday nights for solo and partner whist. Saturdays were often musical evenings. 
Madge, Mita and Eileen sang close harmony. Cousin Joe played banjo and violin. May's husband Ernie played guitar and sang Negro spirituals, shortening bread, water boy and so on. Dad's party pieces were Ora Pro Nobis and The Old Bog Road. And he knew by heart all of Barbara Fritchie. Who touches a hair on yon grey head that dies like a dog. March on, he said. The amazing Madge accompanied everything by ear. Mama's little baby loves shortening, shortening. Mama's little baby loves shortening bread. Mama's little baby loves shortening, shortening. Mama's little baby loves shortening bread. Three little children lying in the bed. Two are sick and the other almost oh. ten for the and the doctor said, give those children some shortening bread. Every little baby loves shortening, shortening. Mama's little baby loves shortening bread. Mama's little baby loves shortening, shortening. Tell you that's your advice coming up. Shortening bread. Put on the skittle, set it on the lid. Mama's gonna make some shortening bread. That ain't all she's gonna make. Mama's gonna make a little coffee too. Mama's gonna make a little coffee too. My feet are here on Broadway, this blessed harvest morn. But oh, the egg that's in them for the place where I was born. My weary hands are blistered from work in cold and heat. And oh, to swing a scythe today through fields of Irish wheat. Had I the chance to wander back, not on a king's abode. Tis soon I see the hawthorn tree by the old bog road. Had I the chance to wander back, not on a king's abode. Tis soon I see the the old bog road. What a boy. Where are you hiding? If you don't come, I'm going to tell your mommy. There ain't no hammer that on this mountain that ring like my boys. That ring like mine Gonna bust this rock, boys From higher to Macon And get back to the jail, boys Yes, back to the jail Jack of the diamonds Yes, Jack of the diamonds And know of your old boys Yes, know of your old You rob my pocket <laughs> Rob of my pocket of silver and gold, boys, of silver and gold. I like a nice cup, cup of tea, tea in, in the morning, morning for the start the day you see. Take away, Jimmy. And at half past eleven, well, my idea of heaven is a nice cup of in tea. I like a nice cup of tea with my dinner And a nice cup of tea with my tea And when it's time for bed There's a lot to be said For a nice cup of tea When those children sick in bed Heard that talk about shortening bread Popped up well to dance and sing Skipped around and cut the pigeon wing Woo! Mama's little baby loves shortening Oh, I feel like clapping. <laughs> that was just gorgeous, we remember. Um, thank you for uh, to Olivia and Tracy um, and Rachel, um, David for uh, the, the chat. Um, Fraffy and he said, how do we manage that? Well, he's going to pop up later on, actually. You'll be pleased to know. 
Um, but how did we how did we get them all? Never mind David's radio play. Um, we had Stuart, Katie, uh, Fra, Claire Galway, Michael Nevin. Um, it was a, a wonderful piece, and yes, hopefully it'll it'll come to life again. Um, oh, that's that's just that's just great. That's <laughs> cheered me up. Um, then the next piece I want to play for you now is also from this anthology, um, but um, it's actually Jimmy himself. Um, I thought, well, tonight couldn't be uh, a night about Jimmy without the big man himself making an appearance. Um, thankfully, he recorded quite a lot of his poems, um, uh, also with his the incidental music that he he was very much part of of any per performance of his poetry. Um, so the piece I'm going to uh, play now is Victoria Park, um, recited by, by Jimmy. Victoria Park was Shangri-La, tra-la. Matchstick men on a bowling green and estragon in an open air arena. The river of life ran round and round. The stream of oblivion flowed through sewers measureless. The flowers that bloom in the spring, Trala, had something to do with it. Belfast puffers stopped at Sydenham, trains and drains hell-bent for Zanadu and Pumping Station Island. Back at the ranch, you had heard Samuel Scheidt on the third. But against the Napoleonic backdrop, you really saw be held with your two eyes, the swan of Tuonella. Thank you, Andrew. Um, I would love to invite uh, some of Jimmy's family um, now to, to speak. And thank you, Amanda, for, um, for sending that wee note in the chat. So you're probably the only person still alive who actually lived at 30 Park Avenue for a short while. Um, do you want to unmute there and just pop in and say hello? That's it. Am I out? Am I in? You're in, you're in. <laughs> yes. Hello. I, I am probably, as I said, the only person who, as a very small child, uh, lived uh, when mum and dad came over to, to England to find somewhere to live. We children were left with granny and grandpa at 30 Park Avenue. And of course, we used to go and visit quite, quite often. So when I saw home uh, again for the first time, the recording, uh, it was lovely because it really did spark all sorts of memories uh, of uh, ta our time there and, and Mita and Madge and Uncle Harry who lived just a couple of doors away and uh, the mad Mrs Swinson who I, I remember as a child uh, and she would have seemed very old to me which she was probably younger than I am now uh, wandering um, up and down behind a curtain in what was once the master bedroom and I absolutely loved it Claire but uh, yes uh, thank you um, for, for this lovely evening because it, it is bringing back so many memories and uh, dad would have absolutely been blown away by it so thank you. Oh you're very welcome and thank you um, it's so lovely to have you on and yeah I, I agree I think he would have loved this not not the zoom bit of it I'm sure. No. <laughs> I'd say, I'd say most of it was most of us would enjoy it being uh, a live in person uh, singing around a piano with a few maybe glasses of wine. But uh, yeah. yeah, it's been it's lovely. It's absolutely beautiful. And thanks so much. Um, it actually isn't. It wasn't my my idea. I was invited here. This this really is Rubina's um, Rubina's event. So um, I'll invite Rubina and Toto now to um, join us. Uh, just as, as we kind of wrap up the evening um, and talk just a little bit. Hi, guys. Good to you. Yes. You're on, you're on. Oh, well, thank you so much, everybody. I, I, I don't want to name names because I'm bound to miss out some names, but thank you so much. 
east side for putting this on and remembering Jimmy and everybody else. I mean, we're very lucky that a lot of people in life, when they lose somebody, that, that's kind of the end of it. But for having Jimmy's legacy, um, which I keep delving into, it, it's just wonderful to be able to carry on with that. And um, I thank you because I threw an absolute tsunami of Jimmy's work at you and you've come out and made a perfect little capsule of it. Um, we could go on forever, but the nicest thing about all this for us, Toto, Mandy, Josh, I and Rachel and Katie and Charlotte for the family is that um, Jimmy in life, life after death really is um, engaging with a new generation. And that's the most wonderful thing that he, his life's been all about linking bridges and uh, we're engaging with a completely new generation um, and long may it last. Um, the swan of Tuonella under the bridge, I've just realized that that swan must have started off in Victoria Park, must it, before it ended up under the bridge. But that's in two, two Jimmys, the James Ellis, Jimmy's father, and James Ellis, the one we know. Um, I realized delving through all this, I need an amanuensis, amanuensis if somebody will volunteer to pull Jimmy's stuff together. Um, and the thing I've, I'm so, it's lovely to hear what David Johnson has said about Jimmy, and we've, even, we've only scraped the edge of anything about all that Jimmy had such a deep mind. That's one of Tuonelli. I could go on making connections, which Jimmy did with Michelangelo and W.B. Yates, and it, it goes on and on. Um, and I just thank you so much. It's been absolutely wonderful. And one little interesting thing is in Jimmy's study, there's been a, all over the winter, there's been a Red Admiral hibernating beside a picture of Jimmy's. And just as Toto went down to collect something that hopefully he's going to read now, if you don't mind if he's got time, um, it's come out of hibernation. It's sitting up here. It's been flying around the room all the time. This has been on and it's just sat up there. <laughs> so uh, we've got the butterfly is with us and then to Toto, he's got a poem that I, I've not touched anything on Jimmy's desk and Toto is just going to read one of the last things that we found on Jimmy's desk. Well, can I ask before, uh, before you yeah. do, Toto, because I will speak to you, but, um, Katie and Charlotte hear. have also recorded oh, yes, uh, yes, a yeah. beautiful piece. Yeah. Uh, so it'll be nice to, um, so Katie and Charlotte, um, uh, Jimmy's granddaughters who can't be here, but uh, they'd recorded a piece and uh, we have actually put it, you don't know this Rabina, but we have put it to the footage of Jimmy walking around the, the empty house. Um, so uh, the, the, the beautiful film of him in Park Avenue. So this all ties really nicely. So we'll oh, play it first better. and then come back to you. Thank you.
Um, so that was Katie and Charlotte um, playing The Gentle Light That Wakes. Um, Toto, um, uh, Amanda, hopefully you enjoyed that reminiscence as well around the house. Um, Toto, can I bring you back? Sure. Uh, if you're there. Hello. How are you doing? Hey. <laughs> so you find a piece um, on your daddy's desk that you're going to read first. Yes. Yeah, I mean, this wasn't planned, actually, but... Um, no, it's not of... my schedule, Toto. You didn't tell me. <laughs> exactly. You see. But you get an exclusive, <laughs> unpublished work. Wow. Um, this is kind of testament to how... Da By the way, that um, recording of him reading earlier was done in this very bedroom uh, that we're in Just here. Right here. Uh, literally, the speakers are still here, actually, that we recorded on. Um, very typical of Dad. Uh, was the fact that he didn't just use um, poetry as a kind of an outlet for, for his own fascinating mind, but also as a way of kind of expressing his view of the world or where the world was headed or where his, his life was perhaps headed. And we've never shared this, but we thought this would be a nice moment. This is the last thing Dad ever wrote. And, it's set, and it actually has been sat on his desk uh, to this day. And it's called Mortality which is kind of incredible because clearly this was someone that knew of their uh, perhaps impending end of their, of their ever-present mortality and, and of course expressed it in perfect form and poetry. So um, I'll read you it. And don't worry, it is a little sad. It's a reflection on mortality, but it ends on a, ends on a positive flourish as this is often the way. Mortality is the cruelest gift. First it gives and then it takes away leaving those behind in disarray, knowing only that they are bereft. Whether the end be lingering or swift, the message is we are all made of clay and our own brief spell seems no more than a day. Small comfort for the loved ones who are left. What of an afterlife if there is one? No traveler has returned to tell his story in the unending saga of our history which leads to an obvious conclusion. Beyond the grave is uncharted territory and our future is an unsolved mystery. Wow, thank you. That's beautiful. I feel I can't really add anything to his own words, so I'm not going to try to, but kind of how incredible to, to commit that, even in, in those kind of final days to commit it into, poetic form and in fact actually there's another one next to it called hereafter but uh, that's for another day oh, wow do you know what uh, for another day is right there is so much we could do a uh, season michelle from east side partnership we could do a season of jimmy ellis um with with the with the amount of material and work uh, that we have had but that was absolutely gorgeous um thanks so much um would anybody like to say anything before we go? Um, I, it, I really, this this kind of brings everything to um, a, a really nice close and almost in time as well, which is which is fantastic. Um, and what what I had hoped to um, to do just to to finish off is to play a recording of um, Eileen Arun, which is a song. Um, that is that was part of um, Home Again production um, and a song that was very much uh, sung in, in uh, the Alice household um, and obviously uh, Eileen, Jimmy's sister, being a big part of his life and inspiration. Um, it's sung by Fra Fee, who was in the production and is also my brother, for those who don't know, which is, which is how, David, we got him to perform at East Side Arts Festival, let's be honest. <laughs> um, but when he actually, he had, he had never come across this song before, um, and uh, before he did the production and, and absolutely fell in love with it, and that's now one of his go-to tunes uh, of a night. But um, if anybody would like to, to say anything um, or comment, please do. Um, Otherwise, I just would like to thank Robina and Toto, um, and Amanda, and uh, uh, and uh, everybody who has um, performed um, to Katie and Charlotte and Rachel and all the family, um, but also to Stuart 
um, Katie uh, Colum, who we spoke to, and of course, uh, Professor David, if he's still here, um, and everybody at Eastside Partnership, um, Michelle and, and all the team who have, have helped make uh, this evening um, happen. I think Jimmy would be really proud uh, of his 90th birthday celebrations, even though they are virtual. Um, and um, I, I think I think we did him proud tonight. So we'll end with um, with a recording of Eileen Arun. And uh, yes, please enjoy. When like the early rose I Childhood blows I lean when like a diadem buds blush around the stem. beautiful and wonderful friend and actor Adrian Dunbar earlier in my thanks um, for everybody who has, has performed and thank you for all the chat. Um, happy birthday, Jimmy. And uh, here's to you. Have a lovely evening, everybody. Um, and we'll, we'll leave you with uh, Jimmy singing the theme tune of Zed Cars um, and celebrating with us. Thank you, everyone. Have a lovely evening. Johnny Toddy took an ocean for to cross the ocean wide And he left his love behind him walking by the Liverpool tide For a week she wept full sorely, tore her hair and wrung her hand Till she met 
Another sailor walking on the Liverpool side. He said, Fair maid, why are you weeping for your Johnny gone to sea? If you wed with me tomorrow, I will kind and constant be. I will buy you sheets and blankets, I will buy you a wedding ring. You shall have a gilded cradle, or to rock your baby in. Now Johnny Todd came back from sailing. Sailing o'er the ocean wide And he found his fair and false one Was another sailor's bride Now all ye men who go a-sailing For to fight the foreign foe Don't you leave your love like Johnny Marry her before you go 